All right, welcome in, everybody. Evan Valenti uh, taking over the hosting duty of Celtics Speed again here. Uh, Adam taking, I think, a much-deserved uh, weekend off with the holiday, of course, included. I am joining here today, fresh off a buzzer-beater win against the Detroit Pistons, 122-120 in Detroit. Boston splits that series at quick back-to-back, uh, which I think is actually pretty great. A lot of people talked about that. Uh, but we just come fresh off that. And with that, we welcome in Forbes as Chris Grenham. I heard a lot of great things uh, from people at the company, out of the company. Last time we had Chris on, so I was like, you know what? Let's just give the people what they want, Chris. Let's get them back on the show. What's going on, my guy? Do it again. Let's do Let's it do again. It. Thanks for having me on. Not Appreciate a problem. It. Thanks for thanks for joining me here today. And honestly, man, there's a lot to talk about already here through seven games. There's some negative stuff that I'm sure we'll probably get to some of it later on in the show. Um, but if you want to start anywhere, I, and I, I think a lot of people would also start here if you happen to host your own podcast. Uh, Jalen Brown has been on a different planet than every than anybody else, really, uh, since the start of the season. He has been not just an all-star, an all-NBA guy. He's leading his team kind of like an MVP right now, and he's been scoring the hell out of the basketball, coming off a 31-point night in Detroit in 35 minutes. Of course, we go back to the Memphis game, 42, his career high, 29 minutes. The last four games, 20 points, 42, 25, 31. Jalen Brown has been utterly ridiculous. And, Chris, when you happen to draft two wing guys back-to-back, third overall, like the, the Celtics did, uh, back when Jason and Jalen were both drafted. This is exactly what it looks like if it goes really well, no? Yeah, completely. I mean, for a long time, I think a lot of people viewed Jalen as that perfect complimentary guy. And I totally understand that because that really is what he was. And there's a lot of holes in his game. And it wasn't really, you know, well-rounded enough to be the guy potentially. Uh, but my God, he has really, really rounded out his game nicely. He has so many different ways of scoring now. He is a very, very, very confident ball handler all of a sudden. He's a pretty solid – I mean, he's running pick-and-roll possessions with unbelievable confidence, which if I had told you that after his rookie year, even at the beginning of last season, you probably would have told me I was insane. But like you said, I mean, this second game against Detroit was once again he just really unconscious from the floor – uh, 31 points. Yeah, he had six turnovers, but I mean, you'll take it when he's 13 to 16 from the floor. So really, really remarkable. The improvements that he continues to make every single year are just incredible. And I've been long on the train of, you know, I wouldn't give him up in a James Harden trade. And this just further backs that up because yeah, I, we're, his growth is undeniable. We're way away. We're, we're, that's not even a discussion anymore, I don't think. I, again, as good as James Harden is, I'm not trying to say James Harden is that player, but Jalen is the complete package of what you're looking for, both on court, off court, how he, how he vibes uh, with Jason Tatum and everything. He's a guy that you want to be one of the faces of your franchise. But with, with sure. Jalen specifically, you know, and we'll get to all the layers of Jalen, but the thing that I got to tell I, the confidence that he currently has. And his whole offensive repertoire is something we haven't seen. I mean, just this is what you notice of you know, the, the, the great people from the, you know, the good players, great players. And there's the elite players who have this otherworldly confidence that just like a LeBron who just knows he can score whatever he wants every single time on the floor. Jalen's confidence right now. And it came out in that Memphis game where he's hitting mm-hmm. pull up threes in front of Valanciunas. He's, he's putting guys in the blender and pulling up in their face and burying them with a routine. And it's just carried over the past couple of games. And when he's that confident and he has the ability to take over games like with for stretches like that, you know, Boston can survive if, you know, he's low on the floor with Grant Williams and, and Jeff Teague and, and whatever concoction Brad Stevens wants to throw out there. Jalen is proving right now, Chris, that he can handle the offense all by himself. And without this, Chris, I don't know where the Celtics are. Yeah. I mean, it is, unbelievable that he's made this kind of progress like we mentioned before but it's even bigger for the Celtics considering the situation they're in right they're trying to survive this period without Kemba and they're really trying to survive these non-Tatum minutes when Tatum's not in the game and Kemba's on the shelf like this is huge the fact that they can rely on Jalen to kind of carry the load like that you would have never expected that a couple years ago you're talking about his confidence and just his assertiveness with the ball. It it all starts with his confidence with the ball in his hands, because that was the issue earlier in his career. 
you were always a little uneasy when he'd put the ball on the floor and you'd kind of get that tunnel vision, go to the hoop a little bit when he did put it on the floor and you just didn't really know where it was going to go. Now he has that confidence as a ball handler. He's confidence as, as a playmaker and it just translates to the rest of his offensive game and makes everything so smooth. So it allows him to, you know, operate patiently, comfortably in a pick and roll allows him to get around that, you know, 18 foot mark and pull up in the mid range where it feels like he hasn't missed a mid range jumper. in my God, like two weeks at this point, it feels like. So he's so confident and he can score in so many different ways right now. And that well-rounded offensive game, like I said before, I mean, for the situation that the Celtics are in, trying to kind of patch this together a little bit until they can get Kemba back and until they can kind of figure some things out, it's really, really massive. And that's going to help them, you know, stay afloat for the next month or so, for sure. You know, you think about Gordon Hayward leaving. What is he, you know, right. what void do you have to fill, right? Because you don't just have to, you got to fill, you know, 20 points a game, how many is whatever. And his role on the floor is a unique one as a, a wing creator. And that's exactly what Jalen is doing. You know, Gordon left and it, it really left a huge void as, as a creator, whether it was going to come from Smart or Teague or wherever. I don't think a lot of us expected it to come from, from Jalen Brown. I'll, you know, I'll give some people some credit. I was on a podcast, uh, the ATO show, which I know a lot, a lot of you listen to. And uh, my, my buddy, you know, uh, Lucky's Pipe recommended that, you know, he's like, Jalen's going to average four and a half assists this year. And I was like, you're absolutely nuts. There's no way Jalen Brown is going to average four and a half assists this year. Well, I'm already eating my words because it looks like it's po- it's at least possible he could have reached yeah. that number at some point in his life. And we've talked about a few things, but the, his ability – to all of a sudden turn into this playmaker who can make cross court passes on the move with either hand. Like, I don't know where this came from, how, how he found, like, because I talked about this before, there was a shortened off season. When did Jalen have find time to do this? And I, and I know there's a Brad Stevens quote somewhere about, you know, Jalen asked to have more on this plate. So we gave it to him and he's clearly showing us early that he was worthy of said, you know, uh, said increase in responsibility. Yeah. I mean, it's, extremely impressive for a guy his age I mean he's mature beyond his years we all know that but the fact that a young player can step up his role that quickly like you said shortened off season shortened training camp shortened preseason whatever it's remarkable for someone to do that with a full off season Jalen was able to do that basically in a couple months it's really impressive because again that wasn't really part of his game just a few years ago so the fact that you know he's been able to work his tail off and be able to step up and fill that responsibility is huge. He's someone who wants, wants that full plate. Like Brad said, he, he wants a full plate. And I mean, he was not, I expected him to take a little bit of a, a jump forward just because no Kemba, no Gordon for at least the time being. I mean, that's, that's going to, you're going to ask Jalen to step up a little bit, but the fact that he's been able to do that is pretty remarkable in the short period of time. He's been able to do that. And I think it, it goes without saying, but Tatum's taken a jump too. You look at him today, I think he finished with what, 12 assists. Um, so yeah, 12 assists. So, I mean, that is like to have him be able to be that playmaker alongside Jalen while Jalen is maybe taking the scoring load a little bit more today. Like that's huge. So they, the way they're able to work off each other comfortably and just kind of let that role flow back and forth is really, really major for the Celtics offense because Again, it's not always going to be very smooth over the next month to two months. So to be able to rely on those two guys to to fill whatever role is needed is massive for Brad Stevens and co. Yeah. My favorite thing about Jalen Rowe is he's hunting his shot, right? Yeah. You you can see it. Like well, as soon as he gets the ball, there's not a lot of wasted movement anymore. He knows yeah. there's a couple of spots. In the, I mean, all good NBA players know their favorite spots on the floor. It's how can you get to that spot to give yourself a good shot? And Jalen Brown right now knows where his spots on the floor. You talked about his mid-range game right now. It's on fire. He's he's yeah. ridiculous. He reminds me a little bit of DeRozan in the mid-range where it's like if he gets a step by you, uh, he can put you on his back hip if he needs to. We'll just rise up and fire and hit a, that shot. Uh, and it looks so smooth. It looks it, He's like floating in air half the time. Um, and that's my favorite thing about Jalen Brown. But you mentioned you know him and Jason. Those two guys are like almost 60 points a game between the two of them right now, you know, in the fifties and sixties, which is absolutely ridiculous. And what the best part is when you have Tatum who is commanding a lot of attention as a ball handler right now, I mean, everybody's doubling him all over the place, trying to cause turnovers. And, you know, Jalen and Jason still making his way through that, 
But the, the fact is that you have a guy like Jalen Brown who can help bail you out when you need to find the outlet to get rid of it to, you know, when the double comes and he can basically just initiate any offense from anywhere. I mean, these two guys, I, you look at the way they've grown together over the years and, you know, Jalen's leap always comes in the off season and Tatum's usually comes in the middle of the season. I don't know what we're looking at, Chris, in three months from now, if everything goes as smooth as we think it, it should, but these two guys are operating on a whole different level at the age of 25 and 23 respectively. Yeah, completely. I mean, if you're looking for that Tatum leap in the middle of the season, it might not be as massive as him, you know, scoring those that ridiculous stretch of games last February, but you're going to look for him to get to the line a little bit more because it's been talked about endlessly at this point, but you'd like him to get to the line a little bit more. And if you do notice that bump in the middle of the season where, Hey, Tatum decided to take that leap. Look, he's scoring 30 a game. All of a sudden there's a good chance he's getting to the line and, you know, five to 10 of those points are coming from the free throw line, just because you look at superstars and that's where a decent amount of their points come from. So that's probably going to contribute to some, you know, bit of the leap if he does make one midseason. Um, but yeah, I mean, today was a perfect example. Today we're recording this on Sunday. So the second game in Detroit this is a perfect example of Tatum taking the, the double teams that Detroit is throwing at him, the traps that Detroit is throwing at him. And he takes his time. He makes the smart read and he finds the open man, which was often Jalen. I mean, that that is so unbelievable that you can have a guy who is a unbelievable scorer take a step back, realize that, hey, they're throwing endless, endless traps at me here. I'm going to make the right read and I'm going to find the hot hand. I'm going to find Jalen or really the open man at all. Um, he found Tice a couple of times tonight. He was really great seeing the floor. So that combination is just huge because again, if it's just Tatum trying to make the right read when he's getting doubled and you don't have another guy who you can really rely on outside of that, then that's where you run into problems. They've really come to be able to rely on Jalen Brown much more so than I expected. I knew he, you could rely on him to a point, but my God, I mean, on the ball, he's been much better. So yeah, that, that combination has been great. I would, one thing in terms of if we're talking mid-season leaps or improvements, you can't really nitpick with Jalen Brown right now. So this yeah. is just me. This is just me noticing one thing. In the second half, you know, he has the hot hand all first half, right? And then the Celtics start running into a little bit of a stagnant stretch in the fourth quarter, late third quarter. You'd like to see him maybe be a little more aggressive off the ball and coming to get the ball because he's the hot hand. So you got to, you got to get him as many touches as possible. And there were times as this game was coming down the stretch where you'd be like, Oh, I'd like to see Jalen get a couple more touches. So maybe that, that goes both ways. You know, it's, it's him being aggressive and it's also his teammates looking to get him more touches down the stretch, but that is a very, very small request yeah, when yeah. you've got a guy scoring essentially 30 a game right now. Yeah, so right. 28 a game, I think it is through seven, but yeah, they've, they've been awesome. I uh, I said this last podcast when we had Aisha Rod Lakely on, and I was talking about how, you know, this is the first time Jalen and Jason have had to be like the one and two options, and they and they know yeah. that they're the one and two options, right? In the playoffs, they did. Who would have thought, you know, Kyrie and Hayward would go out and like get to rely on two, you know, twenty and nineteen year olds to try and carry you to the finals, and they almost yeah. did, right? They almost did, which is crazy. And then you have, you know, Kyrie is the the one the next season and he kind of bails and so that whole season was lost and then go back to last year and again you have Kemba and, and, and Hayward and again there's injuries there that make this is the first season that, that these two guys have started the year as like you're the one I'm the two we know our responsibilities let's go and they've taken it uh to a whole new level here and it makes me think about Kemba Walker right so Kemba must be sitting there and saying like wow this is this is really something like I, you know, and he talked about it last year, how one of his favorite things about being with Boston Celtic was he could have bad nights and the team would still win. Right. You go back to his days in Charlotte, he could have, if he had a bad game, like you know, they're totally screwed. He could have 50 and they'd still lose. So he must be sitting there right. saying like, wow, I'm going to come back. I'm going to be able to ease into, I'm going to be able to help those guys get where they need to go. Right. And get to help them get to their spots. I mean, Jeff T talked about, how important it was getting Jalen and Jason the ball where they liked it, where they need it to get them going. You know, it's, it's good to see that, you know, at, at, at some point when this offensive picture becomes clear, like they're going to add Kemba to a, two guys that are already scoring, you know, you know, close 50, 60 a game. Like that's, it's an amazing problem to have right there. Well, yeah. I mean, think about it from Kemba's point of view, you kind of alluded to it right there. I mean, 
from a rehab and, and health perspective, obviously he's got this lingering issue to be able to know for his sake, for the medical staff sake, everyone that you're going to be able to slowly work him back. Obviously when he comes back, he's probably not going to play, you know, the second half of back to backs, that sort of thing, but you can work him back into this lineup without having these ridiculously high usage efforts that he was used to in Charlotte. I mean, that is massive because you don't want to bring a guy off cold like that and then just throw him into these high usage situations where he's going to have to take 25 shots a game. That's a nightmare. And it's only going to be counterproductive once you get into the playoffs. It's just, it's not, not a good situation. So to bring him back into a role like this, where Jalen and Jason are clearly very, very comfortable in their current roles, very comfortable as one and two. I mean, that makes the rehab and the, the reworking him back into the lineup situation unbelievably easier. And it, and it probably takes a huge load off of him. It probably makes his process much easier. He doesn't have to rush back as much as he would in a situation like Charlotte or any other high usage role. So um, that certainly helps. And it's the kind of situation is a great one, but that's a definitely a major plus. Before I move on here, uh, I guess that my question revolves around, should, should we be at all concerned that they couldn't handle Detroit a little bit? Like Detroit, took, what, uh, the yeah. Detroit Pistons who were everybody's like laughing stock in the off season. I mean, everyone's like, what are they doing? Jeremy Graff for all that much money. They, uh, one of the Plumlee guys, like I, I don't remember which <laughs> one it is. Uh, you know, should we be concerned? Like they, I feel like Boston in normal circumstances should handle that team, you know, 10 times out of 10. Although the size thing, Maybe, you know, if you look at the, the size, the problem that the Celtics have against uh, that particular team, maybe that's a thing. But look at the skills on either side. It, it feels like Boston should have, been, should have struggled against Detroit like they did. I'm not sure what you're, what you're, you know, if you're sitting at, at a bird's eye view, what your analysis of uh, the last two games were. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's not great. You don't look to, to play like that against an 0-4 team when you go into the back. Uh, I guess it's technically not a back-to-back, but the back-to-back games. Uh, But I think Detroit's better than some people give them credit for. Like, they're really big. They're long and super athletic. Really not a great matchup for the Celtics, if I'm being honest. Like, at least where the Celtics currently stand right now. But they still should be able to beat them. Um, I don't want to say handily, but yeah, I mean, you'd like them to. Uh, But I think Detroit's better than people give them credit for. And realistically, it's still so early. I was not someone who had a lot of confidence in the Celtics coming into the season. So if you were to ask me at the beginning of the year, like pre-opening night, a game that I thought they were going to get destroyed in, like right. I would say, yeah, they'll probably have their, you know, some issues here and there with Detroit just because of the size and the athleticism and, and whatever. I mean, realistically, it was an energy thing for a lot of their bad stretches in these two games. They were just getting outworked. And it doesn't really matter if the team isn't as talented as you. If you're getting outworked, there's a good chance that these guys, this time the Pistons, you know, they're going to, they're going to have a damn good chance at winning because they're, they're playing harder and Celtics brought their energy too late in game one and they were able to hang on in game two. So I don't think it's anything really to be worried about. I think the, the Pistons are athletic, they're energetic and the Celtics were not very energetic. And so that was the real issue in my mind. I just want people to keep in mind as we sit here after seven games, you know, you look at the, the Eastern Conference standings, you're going to find the Cleveland Cavaliers are in third place at four and two. You'll see Orlando at four and two, Atlanta at four, and, uh, Orlando at four and two, Atlanta at four and two. The Knicks would make the playoffs this season and today they're three and three. And the Nets, who are probably the best team in the conference, they're at three and three. They would barely make the playoffs. The Bucks wouldn't make it. The Heat wouldn't make it. The Raptors look like a disaster. So as people panic, and I understand people are panicking for, reasons that it's like oh short season you know we don't have as many still 72 games relax long way to go boston's gonna get healthier as they go they're gonna get romeo Langford back at some point we'll yep. see what romeo gives them obviously the kemba walker thing is going to be huge and i think a lot of us expect danny angel use that tp at some point and and yeah. but you know the, some of this stuff on twitter if you follow on twitter is like a, an absolute nightmare and you know brad like brad's one of these guys that just experiments to see what it looks like like he doesn't really one of the things I think you learn from Greg Popovich is like, don't worry about regular season res- like results in terms of wins and losses. Look at how you're actually playing and, and make sure right. you have enough data to, to judge how well your guys are playing and what lineups really work and what lineups don't. Like as much as I, and we'll get to this debate later, not too long later, 
like I can't stand Jeff Teague right now. Like I just can't, I can't do it too much dribbling. It's driving me crazy. <laughs> um, but you have to at least let him play and see what he can bring and how he can affect right. things later on. So, you know, as much as people want to kill Brad right now for rotations and they look a little weird and like Grant doesn't play until way late today. It's don't just settle down. It's really early. It's collecting data. It's getting guys in rhythm and trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. It's so, so early. Everybody's got to take a deep breath and no matter how badly you want to see Brad ax the two big lineup right off the bat, like he's not going to do it right. We're we've played seven. The Celtics have played seven basketball games. That's not a lot of games in the grand scheme of things. He's not just going to, you know, rip apart his rotation and retool things based on seven games. This is not, you know, seven games coming off of a two game preseason and a really shortened training camp and basically no off season like that. That doesn't make much sense at all. So he's like you said, they're toying with things. They're not going to chop apart the rotation right now. They're, they're figuring out. So it's not, like just because you see one lineup not working for a couple games or have a couple bad stints, it's not the time to rip it apart. It will, I promise it will be okay. I promise it'll be all right. Evan Valenti, Chris Grannon from Forbes here on Celtics Speed 389. And one of the reasons why I got Chris on the show is because uh, people seem to like us last show. The other reason why I got Chris on this show is, uh, you know, Chris, I think people that owe you an apology um, <laughs> over the, over the Peyton Pritchard thing, because, I'll be honest, you were on it right away. You had some great stuff pre-draft about Peyton. I think you reposted after the Celtics drafted Peyton Pritchard. He's been unbelievable. And, I mean, he's been way better than I think anybody expected defensively. I thought today, the past two games against Detroit, Detroit especially, yeah. his energy on that, uh, that side of the floor is unbelievable. And the Detroit broadcast crew was like, man, this guy Peyton Pritchard's a pain in the ass. Yeah, <laughs> He's all over the place. But the offense, the steadiness, how how calm he is, uh, for how many how many games into his NBA career he is, I am I'm floored really by the production we're seeing out of Peyton Pritchard. And my question is at so what point does he take Teague's minutes? Because he just looks like a better player right now. Well, it might be right now because Teague sprained his ankle today, so we might see some games where he's going to have even more of an uptick. I mean, it's rare you see Brad Stevens throw a rookie in with these significant minutes this early. Pritchard is a little bit different. He's a four-year guy. It's not like he's an 18-year-old kid, you know, fresh off, right off of his freshman year. Um, so that does change things. But you're 100% right. I mean, Pritchard was a major concern for Pritchard was the defensive side of the ball because he's not the biggest guard. He's not the strongest guard. He's not the most athletic guard. But he's more athletic than people give him credit for. I mean, that showed in his senior year at Oregon. It showed in his various USA camps throughout his uh, throughout his high school career. I mean. He's a, he's a pesky defender and he's pretty strong and he moves well laterally. And that's shown, like you said, like on, uh, I don't even know when the first, the first Pistons game, I don't, I'm not even going to try to put a date on it. He tortured Killian Hayes. He tortured Killian Hayes. Like, and it's not, it's not that he's making crazy, crazy intelligent reads or anything. He's just making the smart read. He moves well laterally and he's just in their face and he's just an annoying backcourt defender and that's enough, frankly, that's, that's enough. And it goes a really long way. And he brings the energy whenever he's on the floor against a ball handler, he's right in their face. And he stays, he, he stayed really well, stayed in front of Killian Hayes, DeLon Wright, various guys for Detroit. So yeah, I mean, I'm very happy to see him doing well because it, it was, it was disappointing to see a lot of people upset about the Pritchard pick when they made it, but it just made a lot of sense because he more so than other guards could come right in and contribute right off the bat. Cause he's just a smart player and he's a gamer and that gamer side of him shows, you know, like crazy on the defensive side of the ball. So, I mean, I think Brad's been very happy and I think there's a good chance that he's going to see some pretty significant minutes here without Teague. It, it'll be interesting to see. I mentioned the double big lineup earlier, say they go away from that down the road. Um, Teague is an option. Pritchard is an option. If they wanted to go smaller, it really depends on matchup wise, but, uh, but I, I think he would be an interesting option, especially if Teague is dealing with this left ankle sprain right now. So if they wanted to go smaller in the next week or so, you could see Pritchard potentially get some some added minutes there. 
Yeah, and and, and I'll welcome every single minute that he plays. I love yeah. watching him play. It's it's a it's a shame that Tommy's not around to watch because he'd love him. He would love him. He'd be he. This would be his favorite guy. I mean, there's no question. He just brings the defensive tenacity, and that's the thing with with Brad. And I've explained this in a million of other podcasts, right? But I'll relate it to how, the current roster, right? So Pritchard sees the. And you you follow the Marcus Smart example. Marcus Smart saw so much of the floor his, his rookie year. You know, partly because they weren't really that good. That roster was weak back then. Right. But Marcus also could, could defend his ass off. Right. He could he could lock down, not lock down, but he would play hard defensively, stay in front of guys, make it difficult for everyone from day one. And other guys in the past, like James Young, you know, he couldn't get on the floor because he couldn't defend well. And if you unless you're a lights out shooter, which James Young was not at the time, you know, you're not going to see the floor. Pritchard and he has a foil right next to him. Pritchard is an unbelievably willing defender and obviously yeah. in a spot where, you know, they're a little light right now, especially with the Teague news, right. They don't have Kemba Walker. So they need somebody to play back a point guard for them. And so he has that opportunity, but he gets more opportunity because he defends his ass off and he makes a lot of smart plays on the offensive side of the ball. Then you have Neesmith, right? Neesmith can't see the floor because Neesmith doesn't defend at the NBA level yet. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not about athletic gifts because I think he's long enough. It's about knowing how the defense works as a unit. And I don't think so far Neesmith has quite got there yet. And if you're going to be, if you're going to get any playing time and you're going to be a zero on the, on the defensive end, or you're going to be a negative, the defensive end, you better shoot the lights out. And Neesmith hasn't found that rhythm yet because he hasn't been on the floor long enough yet. So there's, it's sort of one of those those things, but with Pritchard, you know, the more minutes he's going to get, it's going to be the better for him because he's going to be a guy they're going to have to rely on. Later on, it, it reminds you about the, these draft picks that Boston's accumulated. They haven't been able to hit any one of these. They yeah. finally got a good rotation player. They finally got someone that can really stick and gives them valuable minutes. So now they don't have to worry about that anymore, and they can worry about focusing on other things. The, I, I, I'm stunned it took this short of time for everyone to fall in love with him, but I'm not shocked people fell in love with him. He just does a lot of the dirty work that it seems you know Boston fans are, are you know in love with from anybody. It doesn't matter who it is. Yeah, he just plays hard. And a lot of it is, it's really instinctual. He's got good awareness and he knows how to be a good team defender and kind of. What was, part- when you did your research, when you're going back and watching all your, because I did, I watched, you know, highlight tapes and it's yeah. like way different, right? What was your favorite thing about him? I mean, my favorite thing about him was how hard he played. And yeah. he was confident and he can kind of control, he could run the floor and he was, he was a great floor general. And I mean, a guy watching his progress, he always played hard. Like he was a little raw in his freshman year, but he got good minutes on a really good Oregon team and he played hard. So that was always very evident. But I mean, the most appealing thing for me was his progress. Like, yeah, he played hard, but he improved, you know, in in some various areas throughout his career. And by the end of his fourth year at Oregon, I mean, he was controlling the floor with tons of confidence. He was shooting the lights out. And you you saw that in the second Pistons game today. Like he was taking some pretty gutsy shots and knocking him down late in the game. And he was on the floor on that last possession as well, because clearly, you know, you have an extra shooter, you throw him in there as a backup plan in the corner a little bit. And that, that means something that he's out there for that last possession. So that goes a long way, but yeah, I mean, the progress he's made, I think at Oregon is something to, to kind of note because look at his minutes in the opener against Milwaukee. He was lost defensively. Like, head spinning, classic rookie. You're looking at him, you're like, all right, this isn't really going to go well, right? And the image that comes to mind is him trying to play some transition defense. He gets caught in the middle and, you know, Giannis is running like a freight train down the middle and basically running him over and he gets called for a foul, right? But fast forward just a couple weeks and he's already making some really, really major improvements as a team defender. He knows where he's supposed to be and you compare it to a guy like Neesmith who still has a long way to go but it's different. I mean, he was a two-year college player, so he hasn't he hasn't had as much experience. And I just think he a lot of his defensive skills in the past have relied on his size, have relied on his athleticism. And for Pritchard, he kind of had to grind and be smart about his defensive game. That wasn't really the case with Neesmith, and you can't really get by with that at the NBA level. So again, that's not a concern. It's you're seven games into his rookie season. That's not a concern at all. But I think Pritchard is a really smart player and he's got really good instincts on the defensive side of the ball. And all of that compared or uh, compiled next to his work ethic is just, it's a, it's a perfect combination. So 
I'm, I'm surprised at the defense. Honestly, I have to admit, I knew he'd be good on the defensive end. I didn't think he'd be this effective and this pesky. Um, so yeah, it's solid. It's, 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 it's major for the Celtics. It's great. And I'll be honest with you. My favorite minutes of the game are minutes when he and, and Rob Williams share the floor together. Cause anything is possible with those two. And Rob is, <laughs> Rob has been, Rob has been the Rob Williams experience this year has been like, an incredible roller coaster in terms it of is a mistakes. Lot. It is a roller and coaster. It is, it is because he does so much, so many good things, and then like he'll do one really outrageously dumb thing a game. And you're like, oh man. The outlet like, pass yeah. today was was all time. It was Steve, great. Steve Stevens' reaction on the sideline. He's gonna have he's a heart like, attack. He's just like this for like 12 seconds straight, and he's like, yep. "What are you doing? What?" I, I think but it then, was I think it was Sam Packard who noted it. Uh, he just hates touching the ball in the backcourt. It doesn't matter does. if it's I don't. It, it doesn't matter if it's under the opponent's hoop. Doesn't matter if it's just over half court. He doesn't want the ball. He wants to get rid of it as fast as possible, even if that means launching it towards half court to the other team. You know, I kind of agree with him when he makes plays like that. He shouldn't be touching the ball in the backcourt. Just yeah, shovel it behind you or something. I don't know. Just get rid of it. But it, 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 it's just surprising because he has. You know the other the other plays he's had where he's like the mid air tip pass to like Jalen or or Jason in the corner yeah. that was ridiculous the bounce pass to Jalen on the baseline I was like I mean like, wait you know this is uh, he, Rob's got my head spinning because I, in in one perspective he does something that nobody else in the Celtics roster can really do at that size I mean he yeah. really does a lot of but his his mistakes often are like are are they seem very childish in terms of what he's also doing on the floor so. I don't know if you're with me on this. I, I do think Rob has earned some more minutes uh, with this rotation because in my opinion, those little brain fart things that he does are only yeah. going to go away if he has more playing time. And for the most part, Rob hasn't done too many negative things to show you that he doesn't deserve more playing time this season so far. I mean, it, it is difficult because I'm with you. He's made a lot of really, really solid improvements, but then you get those, those lapses where you kind of just left with your hands in the air, like what, what the hell is he doing? But to focus on the positive first, I mean, his passing has dramatically, dramatically improved. And I think that that could be so game changing for the Celtics, especially with him coming off the bench. Cause you know, he's going to provide energy. You know, he's going to be that guy to kind of give you a nice little burst off the bench. But if he can act as that fulcrum in the middle of the Celtics defense, and I'm not asking him to pass like Jokic, but I'm just saying he's he's clearly found an awareness on the offensive side of the ball and created, or what do I want to say, developed a, a nice, I don't even know how to say it. His court vision has dramatically improved. And yeah. I think that that pays major, major dividends for the Celtics offense if he can do little things like that little touch pass to the corner and just see the floor much better, act as that fulcrum. That's huge. Defensively, he still has a long way to go. He still looks like that raw athletic big who doesn't always really know where he's going, but he knows how to block shots. And he has gotten better at keeping his two feet on the floor and not biting at every pump fake. That's a major improvement, but there are ways to go on the defensive end. But I do think his well-rounded or rounding out of his offensive game, which is not rounded out yet, but it's moving in that direction. I think that certainly has earned him some more minutes. Definitely. I the other night against Memphis, I, I honestly had to I had to make sure that I, the the stats checked out because I couldn't believe any of what I was seeing, <laughs> but the numbers were real. In nine minutes and fifteen seconds in the first half against Memphis, Rob was plus twenty four, yeah, which is just an absolutely outrageous stat. And again, you know, he's going to make a lot of mistakes, and it's and it's um, part of his development. But I. His his minutes are the most fun minutes in the floor, and, I, and when him and Pritchard in the floor at at, at, the, at the same time, like magic happens. It's it's awesome. It's unbelievable. The rest of the bench, though, this is where I want to end because you know we're still figuring out ideally how this rotation is going to work. Yeah. Um. Obviously, Jalen or Jason, one of them has to be in the court at all times. It's, if it's if it's not happening that way, it, it everything just kind of goes goes by the wayside, and. You know, I, I love Marcus Smart to death, and he's taking less shots, which I'm really thrilled with, and he's taking much more, uh, much smarter shots for the most part. Um, you know, he had a heat check the other day where he pulled up from, like, 32 with 20, 19, 18 seconds left in the shot clock. Um, saw that coming a mile away. But this this team's uh, bench right now is really short. I mean, I know in the playoffs, like, rotations get shortened and everything, but 
I I don't know outside of Pritchard and like Teague, who we'll, we'll wait and see on the injury there. You know, they, they really don't have a lot of guys that can do a whole lot. They have a lot of guys that have like one specific skill set. And if they're not doing that, yeah. it feels kind of like the, the, the ship's little rudderless, so to speak. Like, again, I love Grant. I think he's got to just play himself into, you know, some better habits right now. I think I, right now he's, he has a lot in his play trying to switch everything um, and trying to maintain that shooting spree that he had in the bubble. Um, and maybe he's overcompensating a little bit and trying to do too much. But I see a lot of guys – with like one or two skills on the floor right now, which leads to Shemi minutes, um, which I didn't think I'd see a lot of this year, but he's, he's been out there. Um, I, I'm just a little concerned about their, their rotational depth because it looks very one dimensional right now. Without question. I mean, that was our concern coming into this year, right? right. They have barely any wing depth and outside of that, the rest of the bench is really short to begin with. So depth was always going to be a concern. I mean, Shemi gave them nice minutes today. He gave him 22 minutes, 11 points. He had a nice little barrage of threes that, that kept him in it um, down the stretch. But you're not going to always get that from Shemi. And that's just kind of what we've come to accept. He's going to give you good defensive minutes. And he's not really going to make any crazy mistakes. But, you know, you probably can't rely on him going three of six from, from deep every day. So that brings another problem in because, like we mentioned before, Neesmith isn't ready. So you can't rely on him at the wing. And it's going to come down to Pritchard and Teague, who are always going to probably get 18 plus minutes, 15 plus minutes, whatever off the bench, depending on your plane, you're going to get some Rob. And then you're going to get some mix of Grant and Shemi. Today, you got 22 minutes of Shemi and you got zero for Grant. So it's an odd combination that I'm sure it's going to rely a lot on matchups, but this is a, it's a real issue. And if you get into foul trouble or if there's more injuries down the stretch, it's going to become a major problem because there isn't a lot of production at all off the bench. And again, it's not a bad thing. Like if you can rely on Shemi to give you 11 today off the bench and then maybe Teague another game to give you 12 and a couple assists or something like that. And then Pritchard to give you eight, you can patch it together, but it's not really what you'd be looking for. Um, Cause again, Kemba's, Kemba still has some time before he comes back. He's, his return isn't right around the corner. Romeo Langford's return isn't right around the corner. So at some point down the road, I'm thinking more towards the trade deadline, but that TP probably is going to come into play. But at some point you'll get Langford back and bringing Kemba back into the fold, albeit maybe minimal um, at first, it's going to help a little bit. But for now, it's all about surviving those maybe non-Tatum minutes, maybe at times non-Brown minutes because Tatum in the bench has – has been a popular option with this rotation. So it's really just staying afloat at this point because it's not pretty everyone. It's not, you know, breaking news that it's not pretty. There's no wing depth and it is, it can get scary at times, especially when there's some foul trouble. So we'll see. It's always going to be someone different really every game. And you're going to be relying on some guys you probably don't want to, but that's kind of just the way it is right now. So it's a four and three Jalen Brown's the MVP life's going to be okay. Everybody relax. It's <laughs> going to be, it's going to be all right. You got the MVP on the roster and uh, you got another guy behind him. Jason Tatum is not so bad himself. Not so bad. At some point it's, it's early and I get everybody wants to overreact. That's just, that's just the fun thing to do. That's what Twitter is built for. But at the end of the day, you know, that's why we're all watching games and Brad Stevens is coaching them and, and the, the people that are involved are involved. All right. Let's all chill out. Uh, be grateful for the stuff that you have so far and just, you know, look, there's going to be some trends that you don't like, some trends that you like, and you hope those get fixed as the season goes along. That's Forbes. It's Chris Gretham back again. Killed it once again. Thank you to everybody back at CLNS. Adam will be back next week with me, and who knows, but we'll be talking more C's week from today. You guys have yourselves a great rest of your week.